Augustus Pugin produced a drawing in the 1830s where he contrasted the Gothic architecture he was um, supporting and promoting, comparing it with the classical architecture of his own time. But there's something about this drawing, I think, which is worth pointing out, and that is that both refer to architecture that is essentially stable. It's a response to gravity. And as Coventry Patmore, the most distinguished architectural critic of the 19th century, said, it is this response to gravity which makes architecture successful or unsuccessful. I would go further that the stability that you perceive in buildings contributes to human welfare. If you go to the average English cathedral close, you'll see that many periods coexist perfectly happily. Classical with Gothic, Elizabethan, Jacobean, Cleon, Queen Anne, Georgian, Victorian, arts and crafts. The one thing which jars is the aberrant architecture defying gravity. So I, I, I adopted this um, drawing and changed it, showing the state of affairs today, where you have a pile of sandwiches without any visible support, uh, buildings which uh, create a sense of unease, which do not respond in any way to gravity at all. If you look at any street as it was up until, say, 1945 onwards, you'll see that the predominant uh, emphasis is on verticality. And that verticality uh, depends on a humane architecture that um, also responds to gravity. When you get a geometry that cuts completely against it, that's the same street as it is today, with aggressive horizontal lines, with um, a scale of a building which completely destroys that which exists, you get visual disruption. And it is that kind of thing which has occurred virtually everywhere which causes me to worry about matters. Something's gone wrong. Right. The modernists demanded a tabula rasa, an empty table. At the same time, they attempted to make connections with the past. And so we have falsehoods of fake history masquerading as architectural history. We are told, for example, that Army Vogue really begins in the 1880s. Well, it doesn't. It begins a lot earlier than that. It comes from the Gothic Revival. If you look at those peers supporting the old Blackfriars Railway Bridge, they date from the 1860s. So do the capitals of the uh, urban environment in, in Farringdon. I read many a student essay when I came across the same statement that there is absolutely no historical reference whatsoever in the Glasgow School of Art. Well, you've got a canton bay from English vernacular architecture drawn in the Cotswolds in the 1880s. You have Art Nouveau. You have tall library windows derived from Sir Edwin Lutton's house in Brittany, which had been published only a couple of years before. So there are all sorts of references here. Where does it come from? It comes from that book, that pernicious book, Pioneers of the Modern Movement, from William Morris to Walter Gropius. That gives the whole thing away, making that spurious connection between the arts and crafts movement and Walter Gropius. Similarly, these apologists for modernism 
trying to persuade us that the hall at Blackwell by Bailey Scott, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, is really the same thing as Corbusier's uh, art artist's studio in Paris of the 1920s, which you see on the right. I don't think there's any truth in that whatsoever. This is a spurious connection. And when we read that the bay windows at uh, Broadley's on Bonus, uh, bon Bonus on Windermere, uh, come amazingly close to the 20th century concrete and glass grid, one begins to wonder about one's sanity. <laughs> All about the fact that people are continuously looking with their ears. That is simply <coughs> untrue. At the conference of the, Cong the International Congress for Modern Architecture in the 1920s in Switzerland, the great Dutch architect Hendrik Petrus Bellacher uh, refused to have his photograph taken with the groups who demanded strip windows, who demanded flat roofs, who demanded, demand, and issued manifestly demanding everything that Melacha hated. They tried to rope him in as a pioneer of modern design. He said, I have based all my work on long tried tradition. You are destroying my life's work. I refuse to have anything to do with you. You are violent criminals. <laughs> The holy, unholy trinity of modernism. Walter Gropius, uh, as a, an officer in the cavalry regiment of Imperial Germany, Ludwig Mies, looking rather uncomfortable in his new suit, and the great god uh, Corbusier, Charles Edouard Jeanneret, descending from the, the skies. Um, talking a lot of nonsense about the Parthenon, which he clearly didn't understand. In the years before the First World War, there were numerous designs being produced by people like Gropius and Ludwig Mies for monuments to, say, Bismarck. Now, Gropius couldn't draw. Gropius always had to have somebody as his amanuensis. All the work attributed to Gropius was drawn by somebody else. If you look at those two designs for monuments to Bismarck, one by Mies, one by Gropius et al., it's actually Adolf Meyer who collaborated with him on many things. You see the long square columns from Queen Hatshepsut's temple in, in uh, Deir al Bahari in Egypt, drawing on um, ancient Egyptian architecture on strict neoclassicism on elementary, e elementary geometry. In other words, his, there is a, a strong historical reference. And it's no surprise that th there was a, an exhibition of Ptolemaic architecture in Berlin a year or two before these designs appeared. And if you look at the designs by Wilhelm Kreis for uh, monuments to the heroic German army after it had conquered the world, you'll see that the language of 1941 and 43 is no different at all. In other words, that trend continued. It was there in the office of Peter Behrens where both Gropius and Ludwig Mies worked. The long uh, square columns from ancient Egypt, the simplified elements drawing on um, stripped classicism. And nowhere can you find that better expressed than in the former Imperial German Embassy in St. Petersburg. There it is as it is today, minus its sculpture at the top. Now those elongated columns, 
again, were very much the architecture of the, the official architecture of the Third Reich. This is, of course, 1913. The job architect was Ludwig Mies. Ludwig Mies also, on his own account, produced numerous designs. He came from a craft background in Aachen, in northwest Germany. He produced designs drawing on the strict architecture of Schinkel, on ancient Egyptian architecture, and indeed on that simplified classicism that uh, Schinkel used in, in numerous villas in and around Berlin. And just before the First World War, uh, in, in, in Breslau, which is now Wrocław in Poland, uh, there was a great exhibition uh, of 1913 to celebrate the centenary of the wars of liberation and the great defeat of Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig, when the forces of the various German states uh, and Russia defeated Napoleon and routed the armies thoroughly. Those exhibition buildings include uh, works by Hans Pilsig, which you'll see top right. Uh, you'll see it's a, in fact a, a, a concrete version of Greek architecture. And at the same time, he was designing office blocks, uh, all in concrete, but with visible <coughs> means of support between the floors. Those buildings are virtually uh, um, contemporary. And it's extraordinary that in Poland, in a city that was absolutely devastated in the latter days of the war, as the Red Army advanced, the restoration of the old city has been carried out meticulously, and that the Church of St. Elizabeth, which is crammed full of funerary monuments to German families, have been meticulously restored with all the inscriptions done in gold. That says something about civilization, and it's about civilization that I am concerned. Also, just before the First World War, there was a, 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 an exhibition by, a, in Cologne, designed, one of the buildings, the model factory, was designed by, allegedly by Gropius, but mostly by uh, Adolf Meyer. And you, if you look at the plan and compare it with a Ptolemaic temple, you'll see that there are strong similarities. <laughs> there are also, I think, in the office block, elements from the work of the American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, whose um, work had just been published by Vassmort in Berlin in a beautiful folio edition. The defeat of Germany and the collapse of the monarchical system left Germany uh, not only ruined, but a basket case. Um, Germany swung to the left, and various architects, including uh, Ludwig Mies uh, and Gropius allied themselves with what they saw as a kind of Soviet of architecture. Uh, Ludwig Mies attempted to exhibit some of his works. Gropius refused on the grounds that it was reactionary. So we have a transformation. Mies in German means something that's sort of shabby and rather nasty. He changed his name to Mies by adding a diuresis on the E, so Mies means nothing, and added Van der Rohe, which sounds vaguely grand as being reassuringly Dutch. The transformation then was complete. He became a modernist and rejected all the work he'd done in the past. Um, through the influence of Henry van der Velde, the Belgian architect, uh, Gropius had been appointed head of the uh, Grand Ducal School of Art in Weimar, and when the monarchical system collapsed, he was able to accept the 
appointment under the Republican government but changed the amalgamated all the various schools of art in Weimar and called it the Bauhaus. He claimed that it would be uniting all the arts. He, would, he claimed that it was like, going to be like um, a cathedral um, workshop, a building workshop, a lodge, if you like. Uh, and of course, it was nothing of the sort. He also said it would be based on science, and he appointed people like this, who must have looked very reassuringly scientific. <laughs> uh, Johannes Itten, who uh, followed uh, a cult based on ancient Zoroastrianism, who shaved his head, wore a strange garment, insisted that all his students had an enema first thing in the morning, and fed them garlic paste. I understand that the prevailing smell in the Bauhaus was one of the garlic. He also appointed Gustav Nagel, who insisted that capital letters were elitist, and so that's why his name is spelt with the lower case. Now, this is very difficult in Germany because all mouths have capital letters. Uh, th this is hardly uh, scientific rationalism, is it? And if you look at virtually everything Gropitz wrote, the opposite of what he said is the truth. In fact, what Gropius created, and at least there are some people, they created a cult. And a dangerous cult can be defined as a kind of false religion. The uh, adoption of a system of belief based on mere assertions with no factual foundations, or an excessive, almost idolatrous admiration of a person, persons, or an idea, or even a fan. And the adulation given to Le Corbusier, as he called himself, like all dictators, um, is one example. A cult is destructive, it isolates its believers, it claims superior but spurious knowledge, and morality it demands subservience, conformity, obedience. It's adept at brainwashing, it imposes its own assertions as dogma, it will not countenance any dissent itself referential, and its tame intellectuals are brought on board to construct grander narratives tailored to suit the story, to create a bogus history to convince the dim. And it invents its own arcane language, incomprehensible to outsiders, and that is exactly what has happened in architectural education. Since the, the, the war, every architectural school was taken over by people who brainwash students and do, uh, and the students are waking up. I'm seeing two tomorrow who, what, who realize that what they've been taught is nonsense. <laughs> so we get Ludwig Mies, as he, he now calls himself, designing an office block with a series of elements with aggressive horizontal bands the structure is hidden inside, so it looks as though it's going to collapse, the samples are going to collapse. Heavy weights on glass don't look right. Uh, the same thing happened at the Potsdamer Platz, where Eric Mendelssohn did the same. That kind of language has become ubiquitous. For the first time in the history of architecture, something had happened that was a bearer's. Gropius piously said he would keep politics out of things. So he designed a monument uh, to uh, the workers who'd been shot during the Kap Lutwich uh, uh, Putsch. It was denounced by the Dutch as a cheap idea. Uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe also designed a monument to the murdered communists Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, whose bodies were found in the Landwehr Canal, shot by the Freikorps. Now, if you have publicly identified yourself with this sort of thing, it's very difficult to ingratiate yourself with another crowd of thugs doing the same thing. Gropius and Co. moved to Dessau where they created masterpieces of workers' housing. You can see how well they've worn from the picture on the top right. 
that kind of dystopian environment of leaks, hideousness, lack of humanity, became endemic throughout Europe and America. The Bauhaus has been held up as a model of teaching. Well, the embrace of large areas of curtain walling, glass, made the rooms behind the glass uninhabitable, you couldn't work in them unless you had blinds, so much for function. So in fact, a lot of this kind of thing is about imagery and packaging. It's not about function at all. And when Corbusier proposes to demolish the whole of Paris from Notre Dame north to Montmartre, replacing it with tower blocks, uh, one begins to understand what the future nightmare might be. You'll notice that the drawing on the right shows the ground completely given over to motor cars, and uh, everybody is shut up in tower blocks. The reality, as Louis Hellman uh, showed, was slightly different. Uh, get us out of this hell. Um, Aeroplanes rather ominously fly towards tower blocks mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Crime, vandalism, uninhabitable dystopias. This is the world we have been given. And all the publications produced by the modernists lied. Corbusier, for example, had held up grain silos as a the model of the kind of architecture he was going to create. But he shaved off the pitched roofs. The top picture shows the building as it actually was, but Corbusier adopted the picture to show it had to have the, the obligatory flat roof. It's like those pictures of the Pollock Bureau from which undesirable <laughs> figures have been eliminated. He also based his aesthetic on uh, ocean going ships of the Titanic vintage and on bombers of, of 1919. Uh, making the whole thing look incredibly dated now. <laughs> but like this sort of thing, it's vaguely nautical upper works. This kind of image, raising buildings on the stilts, long strip windows, fake nautical uh, connections, this became the language that was used in the period of the 1920s to the I think until really the 1960s, it became known as international modernism, and it was um, set in aspect in the exhibition, the Weissenhof exhibition in Stuttgart in 1927 8, uh, which was organized by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and various people, Grotius, Meyer, de Corbusier, and others, contributed. We had the language, therefore, that was to be adapted, not just adapted, but became compulsory throughout Europe and America by a series of curious quirks. Now, not everybody was convinced. A lot of people didn't like the coercive aspect of this, the demands, the, uh, the insistence, the totalitarian disregard of everything else, including, I'm very glad to say, people in Britain, um, people like Stephen Tennant, the Sitwells, uh, Cecil Beaton, um, it, it, it was called Bugger's Baroque, but um, <laughs> I, I don't see very much Baroque in it. It was a kind of, I suppose, cinematic uh, lavishness covered in gold, gold leaf, languor, and humor. The point is, it's fun, and there's no fun in the humorous work of people like Grotius, Mies van der Rohe, or Le Corbusier. Osbert Lancaster got it absolutely right. What's the difference? What's the difference? Except that in the Soviet example, capitals have been eschewed um, uh, on the ideological grounds. But the architecture on the right is expressive of its purpose, unencumbered with fripperies of degraded bourgeois taste. Quite so. We're also told that Gropius, Mies, Van der Rohe, all these people fled as refugees. They did nothing of the sort. They, on the other hand, entered designs for the Reichsbank competition, didn't they? 
sponsored by Adolf Hitler. The Bauhaus, which by this time had moved to Berlin, was not closed by the Nazis. It was closed by the yes, Erster who wanted to ingratiate himself with the new regime. And if you look at the architecture produced in the Third Reich, we're told it's all strict neoclassical. It isn't. Look at the aircraft factory up above. Straight from modernism. In fact, there was no official style in the Third Reich. That kind of modernism was acceptable for industrial buildings. And I include in that concentration camps. For more official buildings, such as the government buildings or the great Olympic Stadium of 1936 by Bernard Mark, a strict classicism was the order of the day. What's the difference between that language and the kind of work produced by uh, Ludwig Mies and uh, Grobius and Meyer in 1911? None. We're also told that under Hitler there was no modernism. There's a, there's a petrol station. You couldn't get anything more modern than that, could you? Nor that factory building you see in the lower building. All this has been expunged. It's been brushed out. In histories that are not histories, they're propaganda. Albert Speer himself designed some workers' uh, um, houses for the Nuremberg uh, rallies. And Bruno Taut, who is one of modernism's um, deities, also designed that block of flat you see bottom right, but it does have a pitched roof on it this time because it was built on the Third Reich. And I would suggest that the worker, including the hammer, as an example of public art, does not necessarily assume its right wing. Now, in a country that's going hell for leather for um, arms, rearming, and for world war, um, and you've blotted your copybook by designing uh, buildings in, 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 in memory of communists, you're not going to get an awful lot of work. Uh, Grobius, who, who was absolutely worshipped by the uh, modernist English architectural establishment, was invited to London, where he was uh, he set up in practice with Maxwell Fry. And um, this is a portrait of Gropius by the German painter Max Ernst, which I think sums Gropius up. <laughs> and uh, two designs by Gropius and Fry overlooking Windsor Castle. Uh, we're told the world was not ready for it. I don't think George V was either. So what happened? I mean, what it is extraordinary what happened? Well, America happened. The Museum of Modern Art, uh, Philip Johnson, who hugely admired Hitler, uh, went on the, accompanied the German army on its invasion of Poland and said the country looked so gay for all this beautiful, handsome chaps in grey green uniforms. And uh, they set up an exhibition called Modern Architecture of the International Style, accompanied by a book written with Henry Russell Hitchcock. This, again, promoted the kind of architecture that had been uh, uh, erected in um, Stuttgart. And it's very interesting that when Sybil Mahoney Nodge, who had been part of the Bauhaus setup, the wife of Lassen Mahoney Nodge, said it was quite extraordinary because Hitler shook the tree and the poison fruit fell to the ground and the seeds were picked up and taken to America where they flourished. Meanwhile, Nies van der Rohe is busy signing with others, a document of the National Socialist Party magazine supporting the seizure of absolute power by Adolf Hitler. You'll see that he did not leave Germany until 1937, when, of course, he had a, a well-paid job in America to go to. 
you'll see that he, as he resigns from the Prussian Academy of Sciences, he ends his letter, Heil Hitler. And there, you see at the top of his note paper, it's Mies van der Rohe, Notice the Violaces. So what happened? Well, the war was again lost by Germany, and suddenly, General Motors saw the possibilities in the modernist dogma. He, it got it, in fact, embraced by the legislature of the United States of America, enabling whole swathes of towns to be demolished. And this, again, was promoted by um, Le Corbusier, who, during the war, of course, had flirted with the uh, French Vichy regime and had invented a new sort of person, uh, finding ordinary human beings not worthy to fit in his buildings. So there you are, darling, it's just what we've always wanted. In his Unité d'Habitation, with its inviting internal streets. Um, and this kind of thing is copied. It's copied in London. Uh, one absurd commentator said that this was an example of the picturesque. Well, let's compare 18th century follies, Chinese follies, Greek temples, and so on, set in a beautifully contrived landscape. Uh, compare that with this, is again an example of twisted logic, looking with your ears. That uh, drawing of the uh, one of Brière Fauré is by me. I carefully avoided the detritus uh, lying all over the ground below. Oswald Lancaster again hit the nail on the head. He saw what this would lead to, the complete obliteration of the urban fabric, uh, the fact that uh, here we have workers' flats on Pilotti, the workers would have to be put up in the air or driven underground, the whole of the earth would be given up to motor cars, and that would be that. The poor old parish church is left there as a kind of national monument of everything. And in the middle of the traffic roundabout, there's a medieval gateway to what had been a large alley. And I think that's astoundingly accurate. And it's also not known that, or not generally recognized, that in Coventry, in 1939, it was proposed to demolish Coventry and replace it with a modernist paradise. It must have been a terrific relief when the Luftwaffe did the job of demolition for them, and we had this instead. We are told that the spire of St. Michael's Church, later Coventry Cathedral, um, was an untold boon, and therefore the tower block built at the other end of the precinct was a modern example of a, a vertical element to, off to set off the earlier element. Mm. So everywhere we have seen the same thing adopted. In Glasgow, tower blocks of flats, most of which have had to be demolished. We have also people from the Bauhaus quite happy to work for the East German regime, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, which people like Aldo Rossi looking at the street, the new street in Berlin, uh, said that it's actually really rather uh, vain, and it's a rather more convincing than the kind of thing that was going up in West Berlin, which was supposed to be democratic. So, in fact, what happened was we had a, a kind of travesty of the truth in that uh, anything classical, traditional, was regarded as fascist, and anything modern was regarded as democratic, which, of course, is absolute nonsense. And so we have disasters like the Pruitt Ego Estate by Minoru Yamasaki, which was only up for a few years. The lifts were um, urine soaked pissoirs. Everything, nothing could be done with it. It had to be blown up. And it's also not really realized that when the same architect's twin towers were attacked in 9 11, the leader 
was a graduate of the Hamburg School of Architecture who hated what modernists were doing to a leper and so some of those Levantine cities. And when the Gauleiters got to work in Manchester, they moved people out of their perfectly restorable houses into this. And these Hume Crescents were called Nash Crescent, Barry Crescent, and so on. The, the newspapers wrote about modern Georgian elegance because the modernists had said they were named after great architects. Within a few years, this was the most dysfunctional housing estate in Europe. Mushrooms growing out of the walls, violent crime, muggings on the uh, uh, high-level walkways. Again, it had to be demolished. And when you look at marooned buildings, such as top right there in Wolverhampton, look at the reality of what happens in that museum tower block just behind it, all the detritus, the ruins. That's what it could look like on the left. It's only a joke, but uh, uh, somebody asked me, what's that monument? And I said, it's a monument of thanksgiving uh, for, uh, 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 for getting rid of modernism. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go back to Germany. 1936 to 8. The Heinkel factory. Bottom, the Hudson High School in Norfolk by the, the Smithsons, who, of course, uh, cribbed from Mies van der Rohe. And this was illustrated in all the architectural magazines, praised the skies, and it said it was designed uh, as a masterpiece of modernism. But unfortunately, it wasn't designed for the children who froze to death in the winter and baked in the summer. And because it was, the, the, the frame structure was not properly designed, the heat made the, the steel expand, and so the, the glass cracked. Uh, the maintenance <laughs> problems have been horrific, and even in the recent edition of Norfolk in the buildings of England, it admits that the maintenance problem is huge. We also lost the city terminus hotel in Cannon Street to that thing on the right uh, by the infamous John Polson, who greased the barns of everybody he could find so that he could build his cheap modernism. And the Smithsons, again gurus of modernism, produced the Robin Hood Gardens, which again show terrible signs of stress. If you look at the, uh, the staining on the right and the problems of soundproofing and so on, these too have had to be demolished. What kind of sense does that make? When you put something up and have to demolish it almost immediately. And when Stanley Kubrick uh, produced his clockwork orange, he didn't need to get anybody to design the sets. The Greater London Council Architects Department had done it for him. <laughs> High level walkways, all the cliches, all those worn out cliches, which we know don't work, there they are. And now what have we? We have a complete denial of reality. We have so-called star architects or star architects. We have um, gravity being denied. We have that building on the right almost gobbling up the other building and it leaks like a sieve. It is almost impossible to use. What is the sense in this at all? None. It's all about packaging. Here you have it again, enormously expensive, and this sort of thing can only be done with computers. You can't actually draw stuff like this. I think Louis Hellman got it right. Uh, this is the big underpants, as it's called, an office block in China by Cool House. And Hellman, I think, who often hit the nail perfectly on the head since Swindles Lane, revolutionary architect, Ram Kick-Ass has designed a landmark signature building in the, building in the city. And I think that sums it up nicely. But I've mentioned how certain uh, Bauhaus architects went on to work perfectly happily for um, different regimes. Uh, the Bauhaus was not designed by uh, Gropius at all. It was designed by 
Vega and Neufeld. And Neufeld went on to rise uh, to certain distinction in the Third Reich under um, Albert Speer. And another graduate of the Bauhaus went on to design that um, model of existence minimum with one latrine for 7,000 people, um, the crematorium at uh, Auschwitz, Birkenau. Uh, I think that drawing on the right by Charlie sums it up because we've got the railway line running through the reassuring farm-like building straight to the Holocaust, the burnt offering in the crematorium in the middle, based on a supposed reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon from the 17th century. It's a very telling image. Now, triumphs of modernism. I see there was another fire yesterday. Uh, we've had tower blocks collapsing, systems building, which were held up to be really models of rationalism. In fact, they were far more expensive than traditional building and didn't work. And we have the Grenfell Tower with inflammable cladding. And what have we got? It's rather like, say, the TV evangelist um, and knowing and feeling a bit queasy about it when he's telling us uh, about uh, something we know is not true. And finally, as I, I did warn you, thank you very much. <laughs>